The Figure in the Mist, Part 8, Messianic Christology. The Ketuvim, or writings, contain the books of poetry, as we call them, Job, the Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, Psalms, etc. The 150 Psalms, also called Israel's Songbook, is by far the largest subsection. The Psalms are the poetical versions of the messages of Moses and the prophets. They are, in other words, extremely prophetic and as such contain valuable information regarding the figure in the mist. Now the first place to stop is in the second psalm. Although this psalm is mostly concerned with the second coming, some things are relevant to our present focus of study, the first coming. Psalm 2 verses 7 to 12. I will declare the decree, the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. What a powerful scripture. Now some people think that this is David speaking and recording what God had said to him, but it cannot be. Why? Because God never gave David authority over the uttermost parts of the earth as this ver these verses say. Nowhere near did, did David get the uttermost parts of the earth. Then who is being addressed? It can only be the Messiah. It can only be him. And so twice, that being the case, this is the Messiah, twice the Messiah is re referred to as God's son. He says, thou art my son. And later on, kiss the son, lest he be angry. So we learn from this passage that the Messiah is destined to rule from Jerusalem over the whole earth, the uttermost parts of the earth. And furthermore, he is uniquely the Son of God, not just man. Now, our next stop is Psalm 16, verses 1 to 11. And this is the Messiah himself speaking. We won't read it all. I'll read selected verses. Verse 1. Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. O my soul, thou hast said unto the Lord, Thou art my Lord, my goodness extendeth not to thee. Verse 5. The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance, and of my cup thou maintainest my lot. Verse 8. I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth, my flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in the grave, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life, in thy presence is fullness of joy, at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Amen. So once again, we are told of the unique relationship that would exist between God and the Messiah. Here he is called, the Messiah is called, thine holy one. And this reminds us of the prophecy of Moses when he said that God would give Israel a prophet like unto him. You remember that. And one of Moses' characteristics was that God spoke to him mouth to mouth. He had a special relationship. And that's what's spoken of in these verses. We're told that the Messiah will die in these verses and enter the grave he says, thou wilt not leave my soul in the grave, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption, and so on. Because of his unique relationship to God, he will be resurrected. So a summary of these verses. One, the Messiah will have a unique relationship with God the Father. Two, he will die. Three, he will be resurrected. And now a very famous psalm that is, in fact, a poetical version of Isaiah chapter 53. I'm talking of Psalm 22. This psalm consists of two sections. 
The first one, verses 1 to 21, focuses on the sufferings of the Messiah at his first coming. And the second, verses 22 to the end, verse 31, focuses on his subsequent exaltation at his second coming. So we'll concentrate on the first section mainly, but briefly refer to the second. So verses 1 and 2 says this, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and am not silent. This is Messiah's cry for help in agony. But the agony will not be primarily physical, this is so important, but spiritual. Judaism teaches that a truly righteous per person, a tzaddik, does not fear physical suffering or even death. What he fears is being forsaken of God. And this is what fills him with horror. The more righteous the person, the greater the sense of horror. And that's what's being described here. Now, thinking of the cross of Jesus, this horror came during the three hours of enduring the wrath of God from 12 noon to three o'clock in the afternoon. It was the only time that Jesus used the term, my God. He always used father or my father, in fact, over 170 times in the gospels. Now this use of the, of the term, my God, this unique term, my God, unique to Jesus, this indicates that the family relationship with his father was changed to a judicial one as he bore our sin and endured God's wrath for us. Jesus was, in fact, in the dock and God was the judge. Now, verses three to five. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee, and were delivered. They trusted in thee, and were not confounded. This is a summary of God's past help on his behalf. This is a great lesson, you know, for us. When we're going through a very difficult time, we should remind ourselves of the many times that God has helped us. Now, verses six to eight. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. He will be despised and rejected, as it says in Isaiah 53. This psalm is the poetical version of that passage. Verses 9 to 11. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breasts. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. In spite of the sufferings that the Messiah is destined to undergo, God will have been his complete trust since the womb since his birth. But again, note the mention of a mother with regards to the Messiah, never the mention of a father. Verses 12 to 18. These verses describe the physical agony. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death, for dogs have compassed about me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. It's clear that a public execution is being described. The Messiah will be publicly executed. The reader of the psalm before the 6th century BC 
would probably be unaware of execution by crucifixion, as it wasn't until that century that it was introduced by the Assyrians and Babylonians. However, we know that this is an accurate description of such a death. So here's the amazing thing. The writer in 1000 BC describes something that was unknown in his day. Excessive perspiration, joints dislocated as the crosses dropped into the hole. A ruptured heart, evidenced by the blood and water, no strength, excessive thirst, his hands and feet pierced. Karah, a different word from Zechariah 12.10, you remember that word was dakar, which means a th to be thrust through with a spear or a sword. But this word, karah, describes, emphasises nailing. His bones protrude and his clothing is parted among his tormentors. Verses 19 to 21. But be not thou far from me, O Lord. O my strength, haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling, from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. It's a cry. It's a simple cry for help. The Messiah will cry out for help. The Son of God will cry out for help. Judaism teaches that the Messiah will be the least likely person, the one you least expect to be the Messiah, he will be the Messiah. Well, a person in abject need of help and being unjustly executed is pretty unlikely, don't you think? Now, the next section is a relief. It describes the ultimate exaltation of the Messiah. Verses 22 to 31. I won't read it all, read selected verses. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Verse 24. For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard, My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. Verse 27. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord, and all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. He says here that he will declare God's name. How could he possibly do that after such a violent death? By resurrection and by exaltation, that's how. So to summarize these verses, one, in extreme agony, the Messiah will cry out for God's help. Two, he will be despised and rejected. Three, in the agony of death, he will be stared at and mocked. Four, his bones will be pulled out of joint. Five, his heart will rupture. Six, he will suffer the extreme degree of thirst. Seven, his hands and feet will be pierced. Eight, his clothing will be divided. Nine, at the point of death, his trust will be in God the Father. Ten, he will be resurrected. The following psalm, Psalm 80, deals with Israel's national salvation just prior to the second coming. They plead with him to return, but there is an expression which is relevant to the first coming. Psalm 80, verse 17. Let thy hand be upon the man of thy right hand, upon the son of man whom thou madest strong for thyself. Israel is asking for the one who is seated at God's right hand, the Messiah, the son of man, to be sent to them. We know that this cry for help will be the trigger for the second coming. Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now this is a development of Psalm 110, which will be our final port of call in the Psalms, and we'll look at that in the next video.